today. Uh, textiles and tradition, textiles and religion, textiles and culture, textiles and spirituality. In India, textiles have rarely been concerned with fashion, but with so much more. That first tiny silk cloth covering the newborn, uh, the sari presented to the new bride, the cloth adorning our deities, the cloth we take to the funeral pyre, so intertwined are the threads of textile with our daily lives and rituals that we often do not realize the role it plays in our lives, from birth to death. Sacred Textiles is a series of lectures held by three creatives. And kicking off the series today is Professor Madhusudanan, an architect and active heritage enthusiast, with a session on this unique relationship between textiles, temples, rituals, spirituality, and our lives itself. Welcome, sir, and over to you. Vinnalum Devarkum Mela Yavedi and I. Manalum, Manavarkum, Manbahin and Rani, Tanar, Tamaralikum, Tanpandi, Natani, Penalum Bagani, Perna Perindurail, Kanar, Kadalgati, Nayene, Art Kunda, Anna Malayani, Padungan, Amani, Chitam, Telivirgal, Atan, Arure, Patti, Malartu, Mutti Yakome. Very good evening to you all. Thanks for this opportunity, three creatives and Srimati Mohan. And uh, so it's, it's a very unique topic. Hardly we stop by to think how sacred textiles are. Uh, any ancient culture will uphold its uh, domestic way of life with a lot of sanctity added to it, be it something as basic as textiles or food, the place where you live. All of this is considered sacred because it supports our life here. End of the day, we all take up our professions, passions, make money, all of it, I mean, zeroes down to these essential commodities. And so there is always this sanctity tag attached to these basic needs. That way, textiles is something very, very special in ancient culture. And so, it's a very apt topic in the light of an entering. Hope the slides are visible now. So, the sanctity of textiles. The earliest reference to something close to what can be call, called as a, you know, a woven piece of fabric starts from the Vedas. The Varhadarani Upanishad speaks about that one huge blanket woven by strands, a blanket quite literally, which encapsulates the entire universe. This is probably one of the earliest reference to something, a piece of fabric which is woven which has the capacity to cover up something. So here you have that Brahmandam, the complete universe which involves the sky and all that we cannot see also being packed by a huge, huge piece of carpet. And it is said, the Almighty dances there in a place beyond this blanket which encapsulates. So he within himself holds this capsule of everything that is seen and unseen. So, this piece of cloth which can pack the entire universe and more is probably the first reference to a weave pattern. Ancient references, Vedic uh, traditions talks about sizes and pieces, I mean, different types of garments which are worn. We have something called as the Adivastra which is the basic like your inner garments and your Nivi which covers above it. There are specific sutras which talks about appropriate dressing style based upon the kind of ritual that you are participating. So, the traditional uh, apparel that you wear for a wedding varies from what you wear for a temple and today it is all the same. I mean, we have something called as the Indian formal and so we all go for it and that keeps changing every uh, you know the other year but still we, we call it as a formal clothing but there were specific styles of dressing and specific colors that were allowed, which mean encouraged or entertained in specific rituals. Smriti texts, which is more on the way of leading an Indian way of life, you know, a traditional life, um, 
so that talks about the three basic different uh, materials that goes into your garments silk is upheld i mean it that, that's upheld as the most purest of a fabric and followed by cotton and then bark bark was of course uh, it it was reserved for the brahmacharis people who were students still i mean the people who weren't married the, the kids the students basically and for people who've taken up sanyasa the fourth of the ashrama here so for the the the, the spiritually supreme and the young minds where the I mean, bark was exclusively reserved for them then we have chanakya's arthashastra which speaks about various different countries outside india and the various different regions within india from which high quality clothing was imported and there are references to a place called kaushayam from where dhaya was uh, exported chinna pattascha china china is china of course so china, the silk from Ch china has its reference in in arthashastra uh, again from china we have bhumija another uh, closely woven silk which was also from there and then we have vyaktataha madhuram silk from madurai that's very interesting so there is there has been a silk hub here in our very own madurai city from where uh, this was imported uh, aparantakam kalingam which is today's odisha uh, kashikam the kashi silk is still famous of course today it's a different uh, style there but kashi had its own was a silk hub by itself too vangakam the eastern parts of india vatsakam mahishakam mahishakam is mahishur which is uh, karnataka uh, again mysore silk is still famous i wouldn't say it's the same style in which it was manufactured and woven from the times of chanakya which is continuing till date but for whatever reasons several of these cities have continued to be very popular silk hubs till the present times and then in tamil literature there are enough references to uh, dressing and clothing uh, heroines in the tamil traditional literature like uh, the sangam literature per se they they are generally refer to uh, wearing a piece of cloth around their breast and one on their around their hips which is uh, time and again refer to as cotton uh, fabric mudind uh, mudind kullai ilayudai narumbu shengan mara so this speaks about uh, this is from tirumuruga tripadai of nakkirar where he speaks that muruga in a particular shrine is worshiped by saints who have covered themselves up with dry leaf and grass சிறையும் செற்றையும் குடைநாள் எழுந்த பருத்தி பெண்டிர் சீரு தீ விளக்கம் திஸ் இஸ் ஃப்ரம் புறநானூறு ஸ்பீக்ஸ் அபவுட் காட்டன் பீயிங் ஓவன் அண்ட் ஓன் பை உமன் இன் இன் தட் சிட்டி ஆஃப் மதுரை பாம்புரி என்ன வடிவின காம்பின் களைபடு சொலியின் இழைப்பணியாரா ஒன்பூ கலிங்கம் கலிங்கம் ஜென்ரலி ரெஃபர்ஸ் டு த பார்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஒடிஷா ஸ்டேட் டுடே த ஸ்டேட் ஆஃப் ஒடிஷா த ஃபேப்ரிக் எக்ஸ்போர்ட் ஃப்ரம் தேர் ஹேஸ் பீன் ஸோ பவர்ஃபுல் ஸோ பாப்புலர் that in tamil the word kalingam goes on to refer to a piece of garment so it is not just the region around odisha tamil la kalingam din sonna mean kalingam directly means a piece of cloth mennum kalingam kamal puhai maduppa so export of garments uh, from uh, import of garment from uh, you know odisha has been popular ever since the sangam period and uh, there is this text from the 12th century called as manasollasa a sanskrit text authored by the hoysala king third someshwara which has one part of it manasollasa speaks about uh, a lot of different aspects like uh, you know jewelry uh, making up oneself so i mean dressing up so all of this is there is one chapter on uh, garments called as vastra bhoga the very comfortable and fashionable way of dressing up oneself this speaks about the benefits of wearing new clothes the, the initial parts of this chapter talks about why do we emphasize on buying a new uh, pair of cloth for special occasions festivals yeah it speaks about the different types of fabric that goes into making cloth of course silk and cotton had been the most popular ever since uh, the you know the, the time period in indian history can stretch uh, into the past wool uh, has just been brought into by this king uh, dyeing of cloth with mineral and herbal dyes so there is a lot of references and there are differentiation of dyeing silk and cotton so both of it has been in practice in 12th century this is one and there is this very interesting earliest reference to gold and silver being woven into zari which gets intertwined into the sari to ornament it to decorate it 
there is also this very interesting reference here which speaks about in manasol lasa which speaks about why do we offer the new garments that we've bought for ourselves in our puja altar in front of the deity and then get it blessed by the elders and then wear it apparently you buy a piece of cloth from a shop there would have been someone else before you who would have wanted to buy it but for whatever reasons couldn't afford it and there is this little uh, you know omen which he has just left there his eye is there his eyesight has been casted on it and he or she left and you go and pick the cloth you are able to buy it you can afford it you buy you bring it home it just means that you are carrying home with you not just the new cloth but that little bad eye that has been kept on it also so it is preferred uh, that you offer in front of the god get it blessed by the elders and then take it and wear it so i mean this is now been reduced into a tradition only on diwali day probably you know that we have this um, practice of keeping it in front of the puja altar and the senior most uh, person in the household you know the couple they they gift it to us they bless us with it so that seemed to have been a tradition ever since fabric is one basic essential that travels with us from the time that we are born till our last breath and it it actually has this very beautiful traditional connect where at each stage of life when there is an occasion to buy a new piece of cloth there is one member in the circle of your relatives in the web of your relatives who have been bestowed with that duty for the newborn it is only so and so who can buy when a girl attains puberty there is only so and so who can buy during the wedding it's so and so who can buy so it becomes a very uh, standardized tradition uh, which is upheld in several families and till the last breath so that kind of continues so this title tuli to modi so tuli is a swing basically so apparently uh, the sari worn by the lady for her uh, for her uh, baby shower is i mean that that's protected that's it's kept kept safely and when the kid is born the first swing the cradle is made with that sari and that kind of continues so there are traditions where a sari lives beyond generations you know it's pretty heavy and we talk about three four generations together maintaining the same sari and all that and till the final funeral pyre till then this kind of continues with us that way uh, in any ancient tradition this is not restricted just to india any ancient civilization will uphold the sanctity of uh, textiles <laughs> purity of silk and gold apparently in the traditional uh, or religious textile sector silk and gold are considered to be two utmost pure elements both of which cannot be made impure even if they come in touch with something else a piece of gold whatever you do to it whoever touches it whatever i mean there is nothing that can make it impure similarly to silk also so there is this preference that before you do your puja you wear at least a golden ring or a small uh, chain around your neck and you wear a silk cloth so with this in nothing that falls on you beyond your knowledge can make you impure so silk and gold that way are very very sacred it is so sacred that we have the concept of pavitra malai pavitram as such means pure malai is a garland so we have this tradition of making temporarily garlands uh, that's how they look they are basically woven silk strands of silk which is woven and then you also have cotton strands dipped in turmeric dried and made into these little garlands there you have those are the garlands this is cotton and dipped in turmeric so basically in, the, in our temples we have rituals festivals all around the year the temples the traditions generally they ensure that the sanctity the the purity the spiritual purity on all that is maintained to whatever maximum level possible but there might be cases knowingly or unknowingly some kind of a blemishes would have happened so in order to weigh them off and to purify whatever uh, you know impurities got into your rituals knowingly or unknowingly there is a festival which is celebrated to a minimum of 3 days to a maximum of 9 days and this festival is called as pavitra utsavam quite literally the cleansing festival where all these impurities which had gotten into your rituals unknowingly are being uh, you know removed by these rituals so what happens if something impure enters your altar when this festival is happening so in order to make sure that nothing happens then when this festival is being conducted garlands made out of silk and uh, cotton dipped in turmeric are Uh, adorned the deities are adorned with these garlands it is not restricted only to the deities 
every vessel that you use in the ritual the the bell that you use the gopuram of the temple will be having one small garland on top of its kalasam so for the vimanam so every component in the temple the architectural components the movable the immovable and the priest himself will be wearing a garland made out of uh, the, the pavitra male and then perform the rituals at the end of this ritual and abhishekam is performed with uh, and then the festival gets over so that's how the pavitra malas are brought into the temple now that's a picture from tirupati where uh, the pavitra utsavam is conducted with great pomp and so that that's how the garlands are brought in a procession taken to the sanctum sanctorum and the deities are adorned with these garlands this is from kanchipuram here you can see how even the the processional vehicle the palanquin in which the deity is being carried even that has a pavitram in uh, you know garlanded around it so the the shatari the the vessels the teertha patram the kalasam everything will be having a pavitram male around it so here you can see both the silk and the cotton pavitrams that the deity is wearing so silk and uh, silk is just too pure uh perumal i mean the, the temples of vishnu especially in tamil nadu they are just dipped in traditions uh, very very beautiful uh, traditions that they follow the vaishnavite agamas demand that you take care of the deity like your own kid so there there is this duty on the priests and the administrators of the temple of course and the devotees also to make sure that the deity is treated like their own kid and the anubhavams or the bhavam with which the deity is to be approached has been very elaborately uh, brought into the temple traditions centuries back for example there is this very beautiful and popular shrine of krishna at mannargudi called as raja gopala swami so he is this very royal and the celebrated cowherd and he stands in a very very uh, innovative position with with his right hand he holds a whip and the left hand is uh, you know in a very fashionable way he is balancing it on a cow the cow can be removed so here in this picture he is not depicted with it and as the tradition goes for the cow herd they are supposed to wear only one piece of cloth but temple traditions demand that the deity's crown should be covering his head if the crown is removed at least a piece of cloth should be covered the head is not to be made visible because that's 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 where the, uh, the the energy in the deity is concentrated so it is not to be kept visible for the devotees and so it has got to be always covered and here since he is a cowherd he can only wear one piece of cloth and when the crown is removed it has got to be covered also so there is this tradition and then there is this ritual practice so in order to bridge the gap they have this very beautiful fashion of draping him all around in just one piece of cloth and hence he is called as eka vastradhari if you can notice it's just one narrow but long strip of silk which is used to tie around the deity taken all the way up to his head and then there again it's draped as a turban and there is one free hand which is left um, you know around his arms that way so that's that's a very interesting tradition followed in rajagopala swami temple at mannargudi sri ranga the capital of vaishnavite uh, religion has ranganatha as nambarumat the utsava murti the processional deity and every time he is given a sacred bath he always wears Uh, an exclusively designed fabric in red with yellow checks it's a long uh, piece of garment it's called a kaili a kaili is basically a lungi a very informal piece of cloth that's worn uh, which is generally i mean strictly in fact it is avoided that you wear it when you visit temples or when you participate in rituals it's it's considered to be extremely informal but why is it so that number mal out of all who is very popular for having following all the traditions draped with this kaili there are two reasons one is a very straightforward reason it just goes without uh, it is a tra- tradition from the agamas which speaks about the deity being draped in a cloth woven of cotton so basically the deities can be adorned with two uh, different fabric one is cotton of course and the other is silk if it is a silk as discussed earlier uh, you needn't wash it you just need to sun dry it and you can reuse it as many number of times as you want in a temple if it is a cotton it is it can be worn only once and then you will have to wash it and there are traditions which speaks about what is the kind of water that you use to wash the cloths that adorns the deities how do you dry it who gets to do it all that is well said so here in srirangam the vaishnavite agamas apparently the pancharatra agama the parameshwara samhita speaks about a tradition where a red color cotton woven uh, 
a piece of cloth is used by the deity when he is given an abhishekam but there is a more uh, interesting reason uh, apparently in indian demographics generally this garment called as lungi is preferred by muslims muslim men uh, wear this i mean especially in tamil nadu especially in south india generally it is even believed that the tradition of kaili and uh, you know the the lungi as it is called was introduced here by them i'm not sure if it is historically accurate maybe shrimati ma'am can uh, you know tell about that but it is generally believed that it, it is it is more an islamic garment how can that get into a temple so steeped in tradition and history so ranganatha's temple has this unique uh, tradition of uh, an islamic princess who is it this is this is more a tradition there are no historical accuracies for this uh, apparently during the islamic invasion which happened twice in srirangam uh, in the 14th century uh, i mean historically speaking again ranganatha didn't leave south india he traveled all around south india and he was brought back but then there is this traditional record which speaks about how the bronze icon the utsav murti was taken all the way from here to uh, delhi and uh, the sultan's daughter at once fell in love with the murti of ranganatha and treated him as her friend so she carried him to her chamber she put him to sleep on her bed shared whatever she ate and dressed him up as she liked and then there is this uh, uh, you know the, the devotees of ranganatha from srirangam who went there requested the king told them that this very important icon of theirs which is being worshiped in srirangam has been brought here and so requested him that they are given back and so the king was he was like fine if you've come all the way from tamil nadu let me uh, respect it go and you can take you can, if you can find out your murti you can take it and then to their surprise they discover that the the sultan's daughter was happily playing with him so they waited for her to sleep and that night they managed to escape delhi with the murti the next day morning she wakes up to see that her friend her best friend who was sleeping just next to her was missing and only then the sultan knows that there is a story behind this and so he sends a troop an army along with her daughter and the people who managed to escape the army uh, climbed the tirumala hills and hit the deity there and the army managed to go to srirangam and the sultan's daughter to her utter dismay discovered that ranganatha had not reached there and that moment she fell down and she died so this very interesting relationship that she had with ranganatha is celebrated by giving her a small shrine in the first circumambulate second circumambulatory path of srirangam and as the tradition goes ranganatha till date has roti and dal and butter for his breakfast so and that is then sent to her shrine it is also offered to her and there is this kaili tradition the lungi tradition which again is an honor to her so there are these two versions one that it is accepted by the agamas another that there is a historical reason behind it so that is nambermal wearing the kaili there is just one family who lives in trichy a part I mean in 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 urai or a part of trichy and only they weave this so they have this pattern and they weave it and it is gifted so i would like to add uh, something here yeah. i would like to add something here so this tradition when the uh, muslims came in even now the uh, kaili is worn in kurunjipadi ayyampetta right trichy where uh, you know lot of people, it is exported across uh, india of course mm -hmm. and the uh, of course the checks are very co uh, very common to the coromandel checks uh, coromandel coast right but the borders are the, have that ikat pattern which was introduced by the muslims right. so they have this mashru um, weaving when the muslims came in all these kinds of mashru weaving that is ba the base will be cotton and above that it will be silk the mashru and the uh, lungis came in because of muslim influence right thank you the next is the concept of using <coughs> pearls in weaving the dress so this is called a muttangi angi is another tamil word for dress or garment and when you can afford to make one out of pearl what stops you so the gods and the royal family members had dress which was uh, decorated with pearls so uh, it 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 is a full set dress starting from the crown uh, to to the, the 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 upper garment and the lower garment and in some cases even a, uh, an actual garland has been made with pearl these are miniatures that i got uh, i mean made for my own home deity uh, of various different uh, uh, patterns and shapes so these are popular uh, crowns that are used in some temples okay. so these are just miniature versions that i've uh, got them ordered and made uh, here you can see the tradition of writing in fabric starts right just next to the 
feet of Ranganatha to the left and the right, you can see Telugu script written there. This is a gift from Vijayaranga, uh, Vijayaranga Nayaka, uh, Vijayaranga Chokanath Nayaka and uh, so this and the Moolavar's Muttangi, both of it has the name of the king along with the year uh, again embroidered with uh, pearls. These are more very, very uh, uh, you know, popular styles of headgears that the deities wear. This was taken at Chindadri Petta, huh. uh, where they make this uh, velvet caps for still for the deities, deities. along with the temple kodais. I got my crowns made at Chindadri Petta too. Yeah. There, is, there is a very popular hub, a market there where they work on these uh, temple associated uh, artifacts. The Venpattu tradition, silk as such is very, very, uh, you know, sacred. And when it is white in color, it just adds on to its grandeur. Then silk dyed in different colors. White somehow has that very rich and royal look. And uh, we are supposed to wear a piece of cloth. I mean, we are supposed to pick a garment which is white in color, especially when you go to bed. Uh, apparently, we, I mean, different faith systems have different meanings for colors. White is supposed to be the most calm and peaceful across several civil traditions. And here in our own culture also, uh, we prescribe uh, to use white, especially in your uh, studenthood, uh, when you perform your rituals, when you go to your yoga sessions, and when you visit temples, white is the most preferred color. Multiple colors have been uh, outrightly uh, banned in rituals. The reason why uh, we don't go for lungi or a kaili during rituals is that the, the checks there might distract. So, if you, if you really think about meditating and bringing your uh, senses together and all that, uh, a monochromatic uh, you know, uh, color scheme is what is generally preferred. Uh, of all the colors, white has this sense of peace and calm which comes along with it. So, we are supposed to wear white garments, especially when we go to bed. Uh, the goddess in Madurai, Meenakshi, she belongs to the Pandya lineage. She was and the, she's the empress of Madurai. And so she is given all the royal treatment as much as an empress. And so she has this tradition of always adorning a white silk robe uh, for the Ardhajama Puja, which is the late night uh, temple rituals that happen. So it's, it's a mandate that she is always dressed in white. Uh, just uh, next to Meenakshi's temple is the popular shrine for Mahavishnu as Kallalagar in Alagar Kovil. And as the name goes, he comes from the community of Dacoids. So, he has this tradition of dressing himself up like a traditional dacoit. So, he wears a black turban, has his hair tied into a heavy tuft and then covers it with a black turban. And in, in, in his hand, he holds the valari, a weapon, a kind of a boomerang, a very traditional uh, boomerang style of a weapon that was used by uh, the dacoits then. And, uh, and then he has this little spear, in the, the long spear in his hand. And he wears what is called as the Kandangi Pudavai. Uh, that's, that's a very, uh, I think it has a GI uh, tag. It's, it's from Madurai, uh, in and out of Madurai, the outskirts of Madurai, they make these sarees. This is a very, very traditional and uh, popular uh, sari. So, Alagar, when he dresses up as Kallar, which happens only one day in a year, he is supposed to wear a Kandangi sari. Okay. <laughs> and the sari is also very short, 5 meters only. And uh, Kandangi means Selai also for all the uh, down south. Right. So generally Kandangi just means Selai, sari. Mm. So that's Aragar's choice of uh, garment for his special location. Uh, on colors, the three popular colors in, in temples that we see are red, white and green. You can just recall our national flag. These are the three most popular colors in temples. Red is associated with Shiva as the Samhara Karaka, the god who in whom everything dissolves finally during Samhara Kalam. And then you have white which is associated with creation and Brahma of course and green which is on Vishnu always, Pachema Malaypol Meni as he is described and that is with Vishnu. So, in Tiruchendur, a very popular uh, shrine on the east coast, down south, uh, is this very ancient shrine of Subramanya and there we have the tradition of Shanmukar, the, the six-faced bronze murti of Muruga being brought out twice a year. Once in six months he is brought out, that's it. Uh, only very, very special occasion those are. And in one day, he is dressed up in these three colors. 
So, early morning, first thing he starts with the Rudramsam, which is all decked in red. So, flowers, the jewellery, the uh, ornaments that he wears, of course, the silk that drapes him, everything is red in colour. This is supposed to represent the Samhara Kalam as Rudra. Then around afternoon, he takes up the form of Stiti. Uh, sorry, the Srihti, which is the the, uh, the the next day early morning, I am sorry. So, Samharam happens all through the day. The second day, early morning hours, he is dressed up completely in white for the Srihti, which is creation basically, so uh, as Brahma. So, everything is white on him, the flowers, the ornaments and the garment. That uh, day evening, ar around afternoon, when Stiti happens, that is to, to protect and to conduct the universe, he is dressed completely in green. Yeah, so these are the three chosen colours to depict the, uh, the, the associated activities and the gods. Thiruvallur, Veera Raghava Swami, uh, a very uh, ancient uh, Divya Desam, a Vaishnavite temple very close to Chennai. And there we have a temple which has inscription starting from the Chola period. And this temple has a huge murti of Mahavishnu in his reclining form. And just uh, to his right, yeah, just next to him is seated a Maharishi called as Shalihotra Maharishi. Apparently, he was performing a penance here in Tiruvallu when Mahavishnu came here and asked him, where exactly can I stay for tonight? Kim Griha. So, where is this place for me to stay? Or Yevul. Ul as in my, my, my place to stay and Yevul as in which is my place for staying tonight. And the Maharishi, who was himself very simple, uh, shared whatever space he had with Perumal. The next day morning, to his surprise, he sees Perumal there. The next day, he sees Perumal there and he is draped in this uh, white and red checked piece of cloth and it is a very, very long robe which is again exclusively woven by two families of weavers only to be given to this god. They do not sell it outside. So, this is that. It is like a Dupati Veshti which is very long actually, a couple of meters together and it is just used to cover the deity. You can see it in the painting, the, the white and the red checks there. So, this particular garment was got from the Tiruvallur temple. So, if you go to the uh, office there, they sell these, uh, uh, you know, garments who's, which has been offered to the Perman. Lord. And this is the original one. And so, they told specifically not to keep it with other uh, Yeah, yeah. And this dresses, is more a prasadam. This is just a prasadam. Sadam. So, you can see it in the painting also. And then, the simplest of all, Guru Ayur, Krishna, the little baby he is, a very, very popular shrine in Kerala, of course, on the west coast. And it is believed that this little Murti was being worshipped by uh, Rukmani herself in uh, Dwaraka. And then he sailed his way to Guru Ayur and he stays here. A very popular shrine. And the early morning puja is the most sought after ritual there. I mean, all through the day, the temple has different sevas that you can offer. But in the early morning hour, you go there to see him as a little kid that he was, wearing only a loincloth. The Kaupinam, as it is called. So, that is it. Uh, a Brahmachari's, uh, the most luxurious piece of cloth that a Brahmachari can wear is a loin cloth. Yeah, so it is only after your Upanayanam and all that, you, you actually wear another piece of cloth around you and only after a wedding, the second piece uh, comes in help. So, till then it is a loin cloth and so Krishna appears, uh, Krishna gives darshan as the little kid he was only wearing the loin cloth in the early hours, around 3.34 in the morning. And the Ushatkala Puja draws lakhs of devotees to get that darshan. And then we have the Arayars, the traditional musicians and uh, the theatre basically, it is not just musicians, they are, they are theatres, theatre people, they, they perform uh, songs and uh, they perform an Abhinayam and then also enact a drama. And so, this is a hereditary service offered in uh, three popular Vaishnava temples in Tamil Nadu and there are the Kulla and the Kulla is the bring that out. So, it is believed that uh, when this service started by an Acharya called Srimannatha Munigal in around 10th century, Ranganatha himself gifted his crown to them and uh, they, they called, I mean, they, he uh, gave them the privilege of wearing his own crown. So, that way they have the traditional insignia, the, the Thiruman, the Chakram, the Sudarshana Chakram and the Panchajanyam. The Namam Shankar and Chakram, uh, I mean, always is a part of the embroidery there. And then you have Namma Alvar, the most prominent of the Alvars. 
and Nata Munigal. So he is the Acharya who first started this tradition. So uh, to whom Ranganatha gifted his own crown. And so they always perform this Kainkaryam along with it. And when they start performing, uh, they, they are gifted this Parivattam, as you can see. So it's basically three pieces. This is a sari from Sri Ranganachayar's shrine, from Devi uh, herself, and this is a piece of Angavastram from Ranganatha. So it's a blessing from both Ranganatha and his concert, and then a piece of silk is used to tie it around them. So they are always supposed to stand with this on them, the Parivattam, and perform. It's a very interesting concept because uh, usually India is one place where hand embroidery was given importance throughout throughout India you can see if they wanted to uh, express themselves uh, embroidery was one form of art right okay. from Kanta right from Chamba Rumal where they draw I mean the whole Krishna episode is embroidered with uh, this thing this this came from I think there because uh, they have uh, they have given a full embroidery here right. and then this is the sequence work and Madras is very famous for its uh, uh, embroidery, the triplicant especially. Uh, this was made uh, in triplicant. Triplicant. This so, is from triplicant. Uh, this uh, basically an uh, embroidery called mochi, that is the leather embroidery, uh, I believe originated in Madras. Lovely. <laughs> leather embroidery. <laughs> Interesting. The footwear embroidery. So, this is on Arayar Sevai. So, I mean, in, in temples, ga the, the vastram or the garment that the deity wears. Uh, is a prasadam by itself. So, it is it's, it's the highest order prasadam in fact that you can afford. Then on decorating temples and chariots, we have what are called as tombai, a very clear applique work system where you have these long running uh, cotton uh, you know cylinders like uh, motives on which uh, religious motives and insignias are all embroidered again. So, you have them in varying sizes and you have canopies made out of them to tie on top of wherever the altar is. So basically in, in, in Indian tradition, the deities are not to be kept out with the sky as the canopy. So there should be a, a, a medium in between the sky and the deity. So there always needs to be a canopy to wherever you house the deity. And in most cases in today's context, these are made out of these applique work. So th this has an interesting trivia too. Uh -huh. uh, so basically when Sarfoji Sir 2 goes all the way to Banaras for his uh, uh, Banaras Yatra. So he goes to Orissa and Orissa is the place for this uh, embroidery, uh, Pipli embroidery. So Pipli is the very famous place where they attach these cloths. So when he comes back, uh, Sarfoji brings lot of things from, uh, from his Banaras Yatra. He brings even silk cocoons. He brings the famous Kodali Karpur Sari design Jamdani. And then the Meenakari work which is done on the Tanjaur plates came from there. And of course the, uh, the Pipli uh, embroidery. So it came down and it is a marvel to see because it is a profession by itself to clothe uh, all these things. As you rightly told when the deity is kept on the Mandapam, that particular uh, cloth of canopy which is above the Lord is called as an Asman Giri. A-S-M-A-N, Asman Giri where he is, uh, it, it is like a small shrine, portable shrine. So all these tombais, everything is done even now in a place called Sikil Naikan Pet near Tanjaur. And uh, yeah, if you can ever wonder how long running these uh, applique uh, designs can go, uh, that's roughly 60 feet by 60 feet the base is and the height alone should be around 20-25 feet. Yeah, so it, it is in uh, 120 or 30 parts. So this one was made to order in Chindadri Pet in, and offered to the tallest chariot in uh, Tamil Nadu at Tiruvaru Tyagaraja Swami Temple in 2021. It, it was it was fun to uh, you know unbox them and actually fix it like a jigsaw puzzle. They had a scheme map given. I was personally involved in this, so I could uh, I can recall. They had actually given us a scheme map, and so the sizes, of course, from what we measured, varied by and large because the initial plan was different. And uh, because the top portion of it, you know, the pyramid there is newly made every every year. So it's, it's, it's completely on the bamboos that they get and the craftsman's interest for that day, he can make it bigger than what you had initially assumed. So it, it just, it, obviously it goes uh, wrong always. And uh, finally, you know, so this is, this needs at least 10 days time to fix. 
because he cannot work for more than two hours up there in air. Yeah, I mean, uh, there is insurance, there will be net and everything in place. Still, it is quite challenging for him to stand there, to hold it from one end to another. Apparently, uh, you know, three out of five cases, the wrong piece would have been carried all the way up. Uh, you know, and, and it got to be brought down again and then the number had got to be reworked. So, it, it, was, it was fun and it goes on till the time the deity enters the uh, ter before it is brought down. Uh, the tears of Tamil Nadu, the chariots of Tamil Nadu, I think are popular. One thing for the height, but mostly for the color that this applique cover carries with itself. And the ter, uh, I mean the, the, um, the kodai, the koil kodai or the umbrella, uh, I mean, you, you have, uh, depending on what they can afford, uh, temples like Madurai and Srirangam has umbrellas made out of gold uh, and only pure pearls and then, uh, you know, semi-quality uh, pearls and then velvet, uh, what not. So, the umbrellas for gods are a sign of royal uh, aspect. So, it's basically on being very royal uh, and whatever you can afford, you, you have it done today. And Chennai has this tradition of offering uh, almost a dozen or two of these newly made huge umbrellas to Tripati every year a little before the Brahmotsavam there. I mean, it, it happens end of September or early October. So, around the first week of September, there is this tradition of a very long procession where these umbrellas are carried and handed over to the Tirumala Tripati Temple Devasthanam and they use it uh, every year, I mean, every year it's a new pair of kodai that is used for the Tirupati Brahmotsavam. Off late, they have become extremely artistic, moved far away from traditional designs, and now they have even started recreating pictures as a part of the embroidery. This year, apparently, it was all the ISKCON based uh, Krishna and the Mahabharata paintings as a theme. So, they have recreated in the same color, the same design, everything, and the umbrellas had too many stories, in fact, to tell. And the most important of all uh, in a temple for garments is the Dwaja Rohanam, the flag that is hoisted on the first day of the annual festival. This is a very, very significant event and so the flag hoisting uh, declares out to the world that the festivals have begun here and you are supposed to be present uh, every day morning and evening and the procession will be happening. So, it is a very, very grand event and the most auspicious way to start it is to hoist a flag. And so, every year, every village will have the traditional community of weavers who have the privileges bestowed upon them over generations to weave a new piece of cloth, white cloth. And then this is bundled and offered to the temple, taken in a procession and then offered to the temple. The priests and the temple administration will collect it from them and then hand it over to the potter community who will generally paint on the flag. So, the Vahanam of the deity, if it's if it's a Shiva's temple, so a Rishabha Vahanam will be painted. If it is for Devi, either a Simham or a Hamsa Vahanam is chosen. For Muruga, it's of course the, uh, the, the Mail Vahanam. So, the Vahanam of the deity doubles up as the flag also. So, that has got to be painted along with other auspicious elements like a Purna Kumbham and a mirror, drums, all of this. And then on the set day, it is taken out in a procession and then hoisted. In Kalahasti, which has a very traditional weaver settlement. Hundreds of families of weavers are still there. And there, every year, each family participates by weaving a sari exclusively to be offered during the Dvaja Rohanam. So, it ends up becoming 200-300 saris all tied to a separate piece of rope. And then that is also hoisted apart from the regular flag. So, they, they pray for, for their daughter's marriage or their uh, health and other uh, things. And they, they pray and observe a vow a proper vratam and weave this cloth exclusively to be offered that day. So, almost every family offers a new sari as such, a completely new sari. And then the graduation robe. In fact, there is, there are traditions which are to be followed when it comes to covering your upper body. Generally, in Indian tradition, when it is about temples or visiting your elders or gurus, you know, men are not supposed to cover their upper body. And uh, if, if you attain a particular level of scholarship, uh, that is when you are permitted to wear an angavastram around. There again, you should be covering only your left shoulder. Uh, right shoulder has always got to be open. It cannot happen the other way. It should always, your, your left shoulder should be covered and the cloth should come diagonally this way. And uh, as a sign of graduation, especially in Vedic schools, your Acharya wears this around. This is a very special, uh, uh, you know, embroidery for this uh, shawl. Level of scholarship approved by your own gurus, you can wear this shawl around you. So, this is technically a, a, a graduation robe probably for the Vedic school. Idu, what is this embroidery? I mean, anything specific about it? This is just an RA embroidery. Right. So, 
given an angavastram. Hmm. Uh, so when they wear two angavastrams, one one was the lower garment which everyone um, wears uh, around, uh, and the upper one. So whenever we meet a person who's elder to us, or uh, or when you go uh, when you when you go to a temple or something, you remove your upper as a mark okay. of respect. So this, I think, the acharya bestows on you. Uh, garments and uh, writings that you see in murals. Mural paintings in Tamil Nadu, thankfully, have survived. At least the last few centuries, those that done in the last couple of centuries, have survived, have managed to survive. Uh, and so these are our earlier version of Amar Chitrakathas, where the temple ceilings and walls they managed to paint stories, scene after scene, a proper. As a couple of well, you know, the verbal explanation also happens uh, along with the painting, along with the storyboard. And interestingly, uh, it is in very, very colloquial Tamil, in most cases in Tamil Nadu, at least in temples like Thiruvarur and Chidambaram, the, the write-up uh, which, which coincides with each of the uh, painted uh, canvas is in very, very colloquial Tamil and there you find a lot of spelling mistakes also. So, I mean, it is basically the artists who were very good at painting, but when it comes to writing, they had their own challenges to face. So, I would like to step in. Mike. Okay, I think it's, uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, this particular mural tradition, as you call it, right? So, uh, this came in from the Coromandel Coast, again. And it was called Vratapani. So, it, it used to be the writing. What we see here is a script Kalamkari Sari. Okay, the script, uh, the manuscript is written by the, uh, by the uh, artisan. And then, this is probably the Ramakatha. And I don't know to read Telugu, but uh, he says that it is the version, the local version of Ramakatha. And then it is finished off by the uh, Rama Pattabhishekam, usually any of the themes which goes into it. The story behind this uh, is this, because the Vratapani were the painting scrolls which used to be carried from one town to another, like Buddhist Tankas, which used to be, uh, uh, you know, travel. So these were the scrolls which were used in public spaces to make them uh, look like an Amar Chitrakada probably to understand all the stories and then there will be this Telugu Lippi which will be written in most of your Thiruvarur, uh, Chidambaram and uh, all these temples. So the script will be there but as you mentioned there will be uh, you know there will be a lot of mistakes but here you have an artisan who actually writes it uh, because he is not an illiterate it is very difficult and it involves six times the work uh, in, in a uh, in a script kalamkari so the basis is they have just uh, they have just uh, taken that art in in india art overlaps everything it is from temple architecture we apply it to some other thing we apply it to jewelry we applied it to textiles also so the same way the manuscript was written because if you see kalamkari kalam is a pen with which they write uh, so, you have block printed kalamkaris, but the pen kalamkari gave the artist the independence which the manuscript, uh, I mean, the which uh, had uh, it for a mural artist. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this video of you can see how, how they write. The, how they write. So, entirely in free hand. There is no stencil there, right? There I mean, is the, no he just uh, writes free hand. He just writes free hand. Can't make one mistake also here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> nice. 
wearing Vishwada is wearing one also so i forgot to tell you <laughs> that's why i called her actually she is wearing the script same ka- script kalamkari with the with the oh i see yeah and that's ah, the kalamkari uh, this these were the uh, this is uh, from the victoria and albert museum this is from the victoria and albert museum this is from madurai tiruparangundram uh, and the oh. entire entire one is done in madder the natural dyes manjista it is called right. and uh, a concept called uh, indigo pencil has been used uh, in this particular art so this is a uh, this is one of the things which depict the entire story of the uh tirparangundram pur yeah and uh, yeah how can we uh, forget uh, you know when it comes to writing on fabric the beautiful patachitra style of screens apparently they were brought in as designed screens when uh, jagannatha is taken to the taken outside the altar so wherever he is sheltered especially during the ratha utsavam so it's a, it, they were the screens that were drawn around the deity and it had uh, stories again and texts also and the most popular of the sacred texts associated with jagannatha temple is of course geeta govindam of jayadeva and uh, that's that sung it's danced uh, it's painted everything that's possible to expose or to express geeta govindam happens there at uh, jagannatha shrine so why leave up on uh, you know when you can write on garments why give up on that so i think they have also gone into writing specific shlokas from geeta govindam on the fabric and then the deity is adorned with it this is actually like quite uh, literally submitting your uh, works to the deity so it it goes as a garland to him after all all these are considered to be verbal garlands only right the the, the poems the sacred texts are all considered to be verbal garlands so they have made one with fabric and adorned the deity with it so the interesting concept about this patachitra is uh, what we get from uh, uh, the uh, temple book kovil book called uh, madala panchi so uh, they have uh, documented the entire uh, how it started so apparently jayadeva in 12th century when he wanted to um, wanted to uh, um, you know give the ashtapati to the lord what better way than to weave the Uh, s- sloka on uh, you know uh, about jagannatha and uh, there was a village called kenduli and uh, orissa as you know is very famous for its ikats so ikats la vandana na it is a pre dyed yarn where the slokam is written and then woven it is a single ikat single ikat is only one side it will come so uh, so apparently every day uh, the last puja uh, jagannath wears this uh, ashtapati and uh, of course there are different colors to balabhadra wears yellow um, and uh, jagannath wears red so every day this geeta govinda patta subhadra sorry uh, so uh, all three of them wear different colors and uh, this is the geeta govindam so uh, that is the story behind this kenduli and now it is in nuwapatna village where they still weave that the the one which is offered to the lord is very big it's like 56 inches like like the tirupati permal wearing the Uh, vastram yeah. but uh, this you can offer it as a peta to the lord and uh, i also wanted to show you how this patachitra originated right the the this con- uh, the concept of this geeta govindam orissa is very famous for that so uh, on the uh, on that slide same thing is the patachitra which is the painting scroll the uh, we have displayed a sari which has the 32 beshas of jagannatha so the daily uh, rituals so he he has this besha chandan besha basically Besha. different alankarams so basically different which is hand hand painted on on to the uh, this one. thank you. so yeah uh, i think the 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 garments and the richness of it in jagannath temple alone can be studied exclusively yeah, there is so much to do with that uh, to conclude periyalwar says that the true grammar of a devotee is to do all this 
உடுத்து களைந்தனின் பீதகவாடை உடுத்து கலத்தது உண்டு தொடுத்த துழாய்மலர் சூடி களைந்தன சூடும் இத்தொண்டர்களோம் யுவர் டிவோட்டீஸ் ஆர் அண்டர்ஸ்டூட் பை த்ரீ பாப்புலர் ஆக்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப் தேர்ஸ் தே வேர் கார்மெண்ட்ஸ் தட் யூ ஹவ் ஓன் அண்ட் கிவன் டு தெம் ஆஸ் கிஃப்ட் உடுத்து களைந்த நின் பீதக வாடை இது பீதாம்பரம் தட் யூ வேர் ஃபர் யுவர் செல்ஃப் யூனோ ஒன்ஸ் யூ வேர் இட் அண்ட் கிவ் இட் டு அஸ் தட் பிகம்ஸ் ஆர் மோஸ்ட் சோசன் கார்மெண்ட் ஃபார் அஸ் கலத்தது உண்டு வி ஈட் ஓன்லி த பிரசாதம் தட் இஸ் பீன் கிவன் டு அஸ் ஃபுட் பிகம்ஸ் பிரசாதம் ஒன்ஸ் இட் இஸ் ஆஃபர் டு த டெய்டி ஸோ வாட் எவர் யூ ஹவ் ஈட்டன் Uh, the remains of it becomes prasadam to us we'll take it todutta thulaimalar soodi kalaindana soodum with tondargalum we don't dress ourselves with new garlands whatever has been worn by you and give, given to us as a gift that's what we prefer these are three acts of devotees as periyalvar says so uh, the true devotee there sees a piece of cloth that has adorned the deity as a prasadam and it is called as sesha vastram sesham is something that's used already so here you know the the when when some somebody uses something and then gives us to what as it it becomes it's it's not generally you know preferred we we don't we don't want it but when it comes to the one that has been used by the god it becomes the most purest so in temples there is this tradition of gifting the the the, the sari or a veshti worn by the deities to the devotees and then in some temples when the saris are too many way too many and to expensive also they go to the tradition of auctioning it to devotees who can afford it that's uh, a photograph from kapaleeshwarar temple where uh, you know they have a the, it's a it's a general you know it's, it's open to all they they'll have an announcement board the information board which says on this day from this time to this time uh, old sarees will be auctioned so the temple it's a it's an interesting uh, typical auction house setup there you will have the temple accountant one senior officer will be there and the, each saree will have a number so when you actually offer a saree the saree will be you know written in the ledger it will be taken in the ledger so that num- number after so many times of use comes out for an auction and it will be opened and then the opening price will be declared by the accountant and uh, the the central office will be there and people can actually go for a price yeah they they'll start with 300 you can start with 320 325 whatever and finally the highest bidder gets it it is it is very interesting to notice if it happens almost every month in popular temples like kapaleeshwar and then people take it home and it it is very very special because none but karpagambal has worn it yeah it has stayed on her so it becomes very uh, very specific a prasadam for us and we keep it for special occasions alone add to madhu this is also one of the revenue grosses for any temple so this the one i am showing is a inscribed ram nami shawl when you go, when you visit shiradi or when you visit uh, banaras you can get this uh, mathura or um, Ay- ayodhya or something they'll have this ram ram printed shawls which which is, now it is screen printed of course uh, so these uh, i believe uh, the ram nami shawls it is called with the vaishnava script is a it's a big hit and it's been there from 16th century onwards so the concept of uh, um, the manuscript or the calligraphy getting into the shawls either it is woven or printed or screen printed that's a huge one that is also one and number two is i, I also wanted to add one more um, uh, thing to uh, madhu's uh, point here uh, so this is uh, this is the screen which they uh, put before the deities M- uh, madhu can tell us about the screens which are used in uh, in you know in tamil nadu where uh, it is it is uh, it's you know if you can't see the deity you can see the screen like in kadirgamam or something it can be woven uh, in orissa it's a huge one because they uh, there is a product called dalapatra parda which is got the gi the geographical indication so it is basically a screen you want to add basically, more yeah, yeah. so when a temple uh, you know renovation happens and uh, the sanctity of the moola murti the deity has got to be transferred into a temporary object in which the sanctity will be present and you offer all the rituals to it screens are one of those prescribed ones so you have options to choose from you can actually make a miniature stone icon or a bronze icon or a kalasham or a mirror or a sword or a screen it can be both of silk and cotton sometimes in fact in srirangam the tradition still is that a day before the mahakumbha abhishekam the moola murti's painting is is replicated the the setup the complete setup of the sanctum sanctorum is replicated on a 12 feet tall canvas and the 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 sanctity of the deity is transferred through rituals and mantras to this screen which is kept in the, for one full day all the six uh, scheduled rituals happens to that screen it's performed to that screen and then it is again brought back into the uh, moola murti 
So the screens play a very very significant role and uh, there is in fact the concept of ekantam in a temple. Yeah, there are specific services which happens in a with restricted uh, in viewership. I mean, there is no technically there is no viewership. It's only the temple attendants and the priests who are there. So when when the screen is drawn, everything comes to a close. So and the screens are not supposed to be blank. What if somebody is late? They shouldn't come there to see a blank space. So it is gen generally again an applique or the jari work. They have a, the, the the picture of the deity embroidered on the screen. Or bare minimum, at least the names like Shiva Shiva or uh, uh, you know the, the Thiruman and the Shankar Chakram, at least these are brought on the screen and wherever the deity is present, when, when especially during festivals when the deity is taken to a mandapam, this, uh, the provision for a screen is sought after very first, even before the deity is taken there. So of all the basic requirements that you need, especially in an Utsavam when the deity travels from one place to another, the screen plays a very, very significant role. You want to add something more? So yeah, with that we conclude we've just picked pieces from here and there uh, to just bring in the story as to how uh, textiles are a part and parcel of any ancient culture and in india in particular so starting from cradle to the fine the the, the the pyre there is no activity not just milestone activity no activity at all which happens without something very specific to garments and fabrics so each of the dress that we wear, not just saris, kurtas or whatever you wear, has its own story behind as to how it came into being, the color that it represents, the, the motif, what is it that represents. Uh, I think your experience for it uh, and your love for what you're wearing uh, increases by listening or getting to know these beautiful anecdotes, especially from uh, the, you know, the, the scholars who've actually worked on it like uh, Dr. Srimati and I take this opportunity to thank her basically and uh, to all of you all here also and uh, looking forward to meet you in another occasion too. Murthy Allam Vadi, Engal Mona Guru Vadi, Arul Vartai Yendrum Vadi, Anbar Vadi Parabrame, Lam Shri Tyagaraja Kripai, Shri Tyagaraja Maharaja Vijayate, Arura Tyagesh. Thank you. Me and Madhu had planned for this uh, sacred textiles long back, but always, you know, the topic is so large that we decided to scope it out. <laughs> always, you know, uh, so it was within Tamil Nadu this time. Uh, we have a lot of uh, other things and we are looking forward to put together much more um, episodes in this uh, because you know there is Buddhist there is uh, uh, you know Muslim and you know the Christian uh, you know the Christians made the painted cottons on the altars just like when you have a Rama and Sita so all that uh, is there you know it is just we are just taken off some ice uh, 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 that's it right now a tip of the iceberg as you would say uh, Ramakrishnan can you do the Board of thanks. Okay, so that was very, very fascinating. Uh, thanks for making this Sunday a special one. Uh, so first of all, a big thanks to RK Sir and RK Convention Center as always for hosting such interesting lectures. Uh, I've been a, I've been an audience to many such talks in the past and uh, this was a special one, especially because this is something that I uh, see on a day-to-day -day basis, how uh, my mom actually researches into this, these textiles and, you know, and uh, uh, gets these little uh, uh, trivia or like, you know, these facts that I, I haven't heard before. And what makes it extra fascinating is because we think we are so familiar with our own culture a lot, but this sort of uh, in-depth research that goes into a talk. So thank you, Professor Madhusudan, for that uh, wonderful lecture. Um, thanks to everyone who turned up on this uh, rainy Sunday. Uh, and uh, we hope to see more uh, uh, textile and culture talks from you uh, in the near future. Thanks a lot.